a woman's college from the outside, Virginia Woolf. The feathery white moon never let the sky grow dark, all night the chestnut blossoms were white in the green, dim was the cow parsley in the meadows. Neither to Tartary nor to Arabia went the wind of the Cambridge courts, but lapsed dreamily in the midst of grey-blue clouds over the roofs of Newnham. There, in the garden, if she needed space to wander, she might find it among the trees, and as none but women's faces could meet her face, she might unveil it blank, featureless, and gaze into rooms where at that hour, blank, featureless, eyelids white over eyes, ringless hands extended upon sheets, slept innumerable women. But here and there a light still burned. A double light one might figure in Angela's room, seeing how bright Angela herself was, and how bright came back the reflection of herself from the square glass. The whole of her was perfectly delineated perhaps the soul. For the glass held up an untrembling image white and gold, red slippers, pale hair with blue stones in it, and never a ripple or shadow to break the smooth kiss of Angela and her reflection in the glass, as if she were glad to be Angela. Anyhow the moment was glad the bright picture hung in the heart of night, the shrine hollowed in the nocturnal blackness. Strange indeed to have this visible proof of the rightness of things, this lily floating flawless upon time's pool, fearless, as if this was sufficient this reflection. Which meditation she betrayed by turning, and the mirror held nothing at all, or only the brass bedstead, and she, running here and there, patting, and darting, became like a woman in a house, and changed again, pursing her lips over a black book and the marking with her finger what surely could not be a firm grasp of the science of economics. Only Angela Williams was at Newnham for the purpose of earning her living, and could not forget even in moments of impassioned adoration the checks of her father at Swansea, her mother washing in the scullery, pink frocks out to dry on the line, tokens that even the lily no longer floats flawless upon the pool, but has a name on a card like another. A. Williams one may read it in the moonlight, and next to it some Mary or Eleanor, Mildred, Sarah, Phoebe upon square cards on their doors. All names, nothing but names. The cool white light withered them and starched them until it seemed as if the only purpose of all these names was to rise martially in order should there be a call on them to extinguish a fire, suppress an insurrection or pass an examination. Such is the power of names written upon cards pinned upon doors. Such too the resemblance, what with tiles, corridors, and bedroom doors, to dairy or nunnery, a place of seclusion or discipline, where the bowl of milk stands cool and pure and there's a great washing of linen. At that very moment soft laughter came from behind a door. A prim-voiced clock struck the hour one, two. Now if the clock were issuing his commands, they would disregard it. Fire, insurrection, examination, were all snowed under by laughter, or softly uprooted, the sound seeming to bubble up from the depths and gently waft away the hour, rules, discipline. The bed was strewn with cards. Sally was on the floor. Helena in the chair. Good Bertha clasping her hands by the fireplace. A. Williams came in yawning. Because it's utterly and intolerably damnable, said Helena. Damnable, echoed Bertha. Then yawned. We're not eunuchs. I saw her slipping in by the back gate with that old hat on. They don't want us to know, they? said Angela. She. Then the laughter. The cards were spread, falling with a red and yellow, faces on the table, and hands were dabbled in the cards. Good Bertha, leaning with her head against the chair, sighed profoundly. For she would willingly have slept. But since night is free pasturage, a limitless field, since night is unmolded richness, one must tunnel into its darkness. One must hang it with jewels. Night was shared in secret, day browsed on by the whole flock. The blinds were up. A mist was on the garden. Sitting on the floor by the window, while the others played, body, mind, both together, seemed blown through the air, to trail across the bushes. Ah, but she desired to stretch out in bed and to sleep. She believed that no one felt her desire for sleep, she believed humbly sleepily with sudden nods and lurchings, that other people were wide awake. When they laughed all together a bird chirped in its sleep out in the garden, as if the laughter, yes, as if the laughter, for she dozed now, floated out much like mist and attached itself by soft elastic shreds to plants and bushes, so that the garden was vaporous and clouded. And then, swept by the wind, the bushes would bow themselves and the white vapor blow off across the world, from all the rooms where women slept this vapor issued, attaching itself to shrubs, like mist, and then blew freely out into the open. Elderly women slept, who would on waking immediately clasp the ivory rod of office. Now smooth and colorless, reposing deeply, they lay surrounded, lay supported, by the bodies of youth recumbent or grouped at the window, pouring forth into the garden this bubbling laughter, this irresponsible laughter, 
This laughter of mind and body floating away rules, ours, discipline, immensely fertilizing, yet formless, chaotic, trailing and straying and tufting the rose bushes with shreds of vapor. R. breathed Angela, standing at the window in her nightgown. Pain was in her voice. She leant her head out. The mist was cleft as if her voice parted it. She had been talking, while the others played, to Alice Avery, about Bamborough Castle, the color of the sands at evening, upon which Alice said she would write and settle the day, in August, and stooping, kissed her, at least touched her head with her hand, and Angela, positively unable to sit still, like one possessed of a wind-lashed sea in her heart, roamed up and down the room, a witness of such a scene, throwing her arms out to relieve this excitement. This astonishment at the incredible stooping of the miraculous tree with the golden fruit did its summit hadn't it dropped into her arms? She held it glowing to her breast, a thing not to be touched, thought of, or spoken about, but left to glow there. And then, slowly putting there her stockings, there her slippers, folding her petticoat neatly on top, Angela, her other name being Williams, realized how could she express it question mark that after the dark churning of myriad ages here was light at the end of the tunnel, life, the world. Beneath her it lay all good, all lovable. Such was her discovery. Indeed, how could one then feel surprise if, lying in bed, she could not close her eyes question mark something irresistibly unclose the myth in a shallow darkness chair and chest of drawers looked stately, and the looking glass precious with its ashen a hint of day. Sucking her thumb like a child, her age nineteen last November, she lay in this good world, this new world, this world at the end of the tunnel, until a desire to see it or force tall it drove her tossing her blankets, to guide herself to the window, and there, looking out upon the garden, where the mist lay, all the windows open, one fiery bluish, something murmuring in the distance, the world of course, and the morning coming, oh, she cried, as if in pain, 